the Lord in prayer, and then we'll make a few announcements. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for all your provisions, that you are the Jehovah Jireh. You are our provision, namely in your Son, Jesus Christ, with whom and in whom we have every single spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We praise your holy name. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we exalt you today. We exalt in you, O God. And we ask that as we draw near to you, that you would draw near to us, God, that you would replenish us, that you would forgive us, O God, that you would wash over us your presence, God, that you would um, just overflow us with your abundant joy and your mercies that are new every morning because of your faithfulness. We come and we gather to worship your holy name. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Praise the Lord for this opportunity we get to worship, for this place and pavilion that God has provided for us to worship in this property. And uh, I just want to make a few announcements. Uh, number one, we're going to have a men's retreat in two weeks, the 21st to the 23rd. Uh, if you're going on that, just go ahead and uh, 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 you can, when you make out your check for your uh, room or your fee, conference fee, just write in the middle of the line, uh, Christ Community Church, and write in the middle of the line, uh, men's retreat, and they'll know how to take care of that. Um, also, uh, Wednesday night we'll begin uh, Bible study. In the afternoon we'll have Bible study for our senior adults. It starts at 1.30. And then uh, on Wednesday nights we'll be at 6.30. Uh, we do have a meeting right after church, a church meeting right after uh, the service today. So if you want to stay with us, that would be wonderful. Uh, next week we will start Sunday school. So next week we'll have Sunday school. We'll have uh, uh, all Bible study for all ages from... Uh, 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock, so we invite you to come to that, participate in that. Um, also, uh, we want to uh, let you know uh, that we have been provided this wonderful gift of a, a playground, and so we encourage your kids to have a good time uh, before and after the service. Uh, please don't, uh, during the service, uh, uh, e exit and start playing on the playground. Uh, uh, that goes for the kids as well. Okay, all right, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, I uh, do want to make an announcement for those uh, that know uh, the Staffords, Bob and uh, Gail Stafford. Gail passed away uh, this week, and the funeral service will be uh, this Friday coming up at uh, Davis Funeral Home. Um, the visitation will be at 10. The service will be at 11 for those uh, that are able to come. Uh, that would be a, a good time. Please be in prayer for them as well. Also, uh, the bishops, Johnny Bishop, uh, lost his wife, Heather, this uh, past week. If you could be in prayer for them. Um, he's at the uh, vice, Pre vice uh, superintendent at the Citrus County School System. So be in prayer for the bishops as well. Um, so anyway, let's go to the Lord again one more time in prayer. Then we're going to worship the Lord together. Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for gathering us in this place. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and assemble. And Lord, help us to be grateful. Forgive us for our ungratefulness. Forgive us for our unwillingness and all that has gone inside of our hearts that's not right. And God, stir up our affections for you today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we open in song?
All right, here we are. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see everybody. Um, it's our time of praising God's glory. And I do want to give a quick praise from last night. We had the youth together after our, let's say, Christmas break. We had a really, really nice time, a really nice group. So thanks for everyone that was here. And if anyone is middle school, high school age, please make sure you know we got Saturday meetings and we have a lot of fun. And I want to say thanks to Mr. Sean for a great word last night. And we had a lot of uh, nice guests with us last night, the middle school and, and high school age. So that was really awesome. So praise God for that. Also want to uh, mention a couple things. We have masks and Bibles in the back there on the table. If anyone needs any of those things. And a quick message for the folks at home. If anyone's looking and thinking, are there any spots open? We still have spots open here live. If anyone wants to jump in the car and come on down, there's still space. So feel good about that and the fellowship together. Uh, it's nice. And one other thing that I do want to add, we have a prayer request slip on the back of the bulletin. Um, and it's just that back page you can uh, rip off. And please, uh, if you have a prayer request, let us know about it so we can be praying for you. Um, and obviously there's a point there where it's if you want just the pastors or if the church body can be praying for you for anything that you need for your family or personally, uh, please do let us know about that. Um, we're going to read Revelation 4.11 to praise God's glory. Revelation 4.11 is there in our bulletin. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, we do want to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and all the worship because you are worthy. And we, Lord, are thankful. And I ask you, Lord, that as a congregation today, you would help us to truly do that, to worship you because of your goodness, Lord. We praise you for this day. And we ask you, Lord, you would help us to be very, very careful to give you all the glory this day, this week, and as we live our lives for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, your delight and truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and of the whole being with the will and the spirit. Let's take a moment, just each of us individually, pray silently to God, confessing our sins and turning to him, the God of salvation, for forgiveness. beauty in all of this is that God is not just just, but he is the justifier. He justifies us. He does not leave us in our sin, and he gives us assurance of that. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We praise you, Jesus. Amen.
Praise the Lord. You might be seated. For a minute. What we're going to do today uh, is, uh, this is typical rabbi at the time, but uh, Robert's going to sit and everybody's going to stand during the service. How about that? Is that good? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. But feel free if you get cold or something, you want to stand up around or... Watch out. I uh, just uh, also just want to say one thing is that these heaters yeah. are, are hot, obviously. Just uh, make sure the kids are careful. They don't um, grab the heater. Okay. That goes for some of you adults as well. All right. So, <laughs> anyway, I'll say the names. Uh, we're in the part of our service of teaching and training. And uh, the message today, uh, Robert's going to bring before us, is from Matthew. Uh, chapter uh, 4, 12 through 17, dealing with repentance. And so, uh, from the Baptist Catechism, I'll ask the question, let's uh, respond as a congregation. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is the saving grace by which the sinner, out of true sense of sin, and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does, with grief and hatred of sin, turn from it to God, with full purpose of and endeavor after in new obedience. Amen. Um, I'd just like to recommend a book, too, as, um, as a supplement to the Bible on repentance. And uh, that is uh, The Doctrine of Repentance by Thomas Watson. It's a real short book. He's a Puritan. And so you can get it on uh, Kindle or on Amazon. Uh, but they also have a, a free PDF version. Just search it online. If you'd like to read it that way, they have audio versions of it. Uh, just a great book on this and describes uh, all these facets of repentance that we're turning from our sins. We have a hatred for sins. We've turned toward our Lord Jesus Christ by putting faith in Him, the, the other side of repentance, that we're turning away and turning toward God. And so, um, see what the Lord has in store for us this morning <clears throat> through that passage. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as I go to the Lord in prayer, uh, our men can uh, grab the offering uh, baskets and then we'll, we'll, we'll take an offering for the Lord. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, uh, that even though it's a little bit cold this morning, we thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to come together and worship. Lord, you, you privileged us with this. You, you blessed us, God, with the opportunity to meet. And so we thank you. We thank you for those that are, are connected. We thank you for media, that uh, those that are physically unable to come this morning, that you provided for, for this means so that they can tune in. We praise you for that. Father, we thank you for everything that you give us, the breath that we're able to breathe, the air outside. We're able to take in. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. Most of all, we thank you for our salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for coming, giving your life, dying on the cross in our place, and rising from the dead. Thank you for interceding at the right hand of the Father. Thank you for ruling and reigning over all things. Thank you that everything's under your feet, including death, the last enemy. We thank you that you have called us to yourself. And we thank you for this opportunity we have to come and pray and seek your face and know that, that you hear us because we come in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray on, on behalf of the Staffords, Lord, we pray for Bob that you would be near to him. I can't imagine what it's like to lose someone so close. So Father, I ask you to minister your mercy of grace upon him that you would strengthen him. Father, we do praise you that Gail has no more pain and she's in your presence. And Jesus, we couldn't bring her back. She wouldn't want to come back. And Lord, we look and anticipate that day when we will meet you face to face. And Lord, we want to. We yearn for you. And we just praise your holy name. Father, we do pray for Johnny Bishop and we ask that you be with their family, his boys. Lord, I ask that you would shower grace upon grace upon them. Give them everything they need. Father, be with our sick, Lord, that you administer mercy and healing. And Lord, most of all, we pray for your presence. 
We need you more. God, there's not a moment that goes by in our life where we don't need you. And if there's a, a thought that this comes into our mind where we think we can do it on our own, God, help us to gr grant us repentance from that. Because we know and we recognize from your word and from experience that there's nothing we can do apart from you, Jesus Christ. So, Spirit of God, we ask that you blow. We ask that you would come and, and fill this place with your presence, overwhelmingly so. That, God, that you would not leave us the same as we entered into this pavilion today. God, that you would change us and transform us more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for our missionaries and those around the world that are scattered to carry your word. I'm particularly mindful of the Howards. I'm particularly mindful of different people uh, that come to my mind, that are, uh, the, Falk uh, the, the uh, Faulkners, Lord, that, that, are, that, are, that are giving casts overseas. Lord, we ask that you would grip them, that you enable them, that you would preach your gospel through them. God, there's so many that are living in dark and hard places, so many Christians of a different ethnic groups that are, are living in difficult situations. And here we are gathered this morning and we complain about a little cold weather sometimes. God, we ask that you would enable them by your Holy Spirit and the power of your gospel to preach your word, to stand fast in the midst of persecution. And oh God, that you would enable them to, to declare in such a way that your church would grow, that you would fulfill your promise that the gates of hell would not prevail. God, that your gospel would penetrate the deepest, darkest, most evil places on earth. And Lord, we pray for our own country that you would penetrate with your gospel as we stand on your truth and that you would grant this nation repentance. God, you would grant us as a people repentance, that we would humble ourselves and seek your face and not wait for a, a political change, not wait for a law to be in place, but, but that, God, we would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, be the witnesses that you've called us to be and proclaim your gospel. For in it is the power of God and the salvation. Help us to stand firm in it and on it and work through it for your glory and for your fame. To the ends of the earth, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. you 
future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I which was really nice, and uh, but we're super happy to be back and to be worshiping together with you all and to see everyone. So Happy New Year from myself and from my family. Um, it's such a blessing to, um, to be together here as families, to be growing uh, in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here together. Uh, it's very special for me as well. Um, in case anyone doesn't know me, I've also got young children who are here growing uh, together with your family. So I praise God for that. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, I want to start off and I want to really thank God for the freedom that we have to be together today um, in our country uh, to worship the name of, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to be able to read his word openly and freely, to have 
the full revelation of his word in our language is such a beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to uh, look at one example. Did you have one example to um, look at together from a different part of the world, yet not too far away, uh, to help us not take things for granted. Uh, I have this little magazine from The Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you guys might know this ministry. Uh, we actually did an outreach, a little uh, service project with them at the end of 2020. You may remember we put the packages together. I think it was in late September or October. Uh, I want to read a quick little thing about Latin America. What's going on with Christians in Latin America? Um, as coronavirus lockdowns were implemented across Colombia, so we're thinking about the country of Colombia, in April, Marxist guerrilla groups in the country's red zones carried out violent attacks on Christians, returning to the brutality they were known for in former years. Uh, the quote here says, as the military retreated from the town due to the lockdown, so the, the government military, the legitimate military, was leaving the town because of the lockdowns, the guerrillas used that opportunity. This is from a VOM worker, Voice of the Martyr worker. They're just walking house to house, pulling people out and shooting them. Video confirming the reports shows members of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, it's a group known as FARC, going house to house looking for anyone who would defy them. They killed an estimated 40 people in a single day. As in the past, the Marxist guerrillas focused their attacks on Christians, particularly on former FARC members who had left the group to follow Jesus Christ. Some believers, fearing for their lives, slept on church floors to avoid discovery. The guerrillas also closed a number of churches during the lockdown, chaining the doors shut and spray painting their name on the building. If anyone dares to open the churches, they will be killed. Uh, continuing on this article, it says, In Cuba, Christians struggle with the communist government there. Uh, that was something that was going on recently. In southern Mexico, it says Christians had struggles with local Marxist rebels. In southern Mexico as well, down in the Chiapas region, if you're familiar with that area, not far at all um, from our nation. Um, and they have problems in Mexico also with the occult practices of indigenous groups. And then bumping back forward into Colombia, it says uh, they were in need of assistance as the violence from guerrilla groups continued. This one struck home a FARC. The FARC, that military group, prevented one pastor from buying groceries for his family for several months, threatening to kill him if he tried to provide food for his wife, children, and himself. They targeted this pastor simply because he shared the gospel, which runs counter to the group's Marxist ideology and undermines its control over people in the area. And there's one picture in this article which I thought was very nice. Uh, and you can look at it uh, at the end of the service if you'd like to. But it's back in Colombia. It says frontline workers in Colombia's red zones use wooden river boats, river boats, to deliver goods and Bibles as well as make, bring people to church. So instead of a bus ministry in this part of Colombia, they have a boat ministry. And in this picture, it looks like there's about 23 people from what I could count. So these are families going to church on the river, picking people up. And it's a, a boat that looks like it's about five feet wide maybe, loaded down with gear, either to help people or to get to church. So that um, should help us maybe to put things in perspective uh, for some of those young people or not so young people who think, oh man, gotta get up and get out to La Canto. It's even a little cold. Well, at least we don't have Marxist rebels targeting us as we're on the way or um, trying to keep us from eating. Um, and I want to take a quick second and really thank Pastor Brian also for his uh, dedication and his intentionality for leading the church um, and the congregation to be engaged with the Word of God um, individually and as a family. And I hope everyone got the email from December 30th. If you didn't, um, I'd, like for, I'd like to get it to you because it was a great encouragement to me. And I want to echo the encouragement to each and every family um, to start to read the Scripture each day. Um, whether it be individually or, like I said, as a family. And we've done that. Our children, Annabelle and Priscilla, were extremely excited to begin. And we did that January 1st. And, uh, and on that email, there were different plans. Uh, there are different, uh, everyone has different reading levels and, and different levels of time available. But in our family, uh, we're reading 12 to 15 minutes a day. So that's, I don't think that's anything that's unmanageable. I think it's very nice. And we... 
according to what we have going on in the family and how much time we have, we discuss just what we read in those in those passages. And it can be in the morning, it can be at night, uh, but it will never be time wasted for you and for your family. Um, engaging the Word of God personally will literally change your life. If you don't know that, that's a promise from God's Word, not from me. Um, and it will help us to, to obey the command we have from Paul in Romans 12, where he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So that will help us to obey the command we have from Scripture when we're engaged in a word like that. Um, and, you know, coming back to the, the thing about the voice of the martyrs, you know, why do I say these things? To say, you know, like, oh, come on, guys, you got to toughen up. Come on, guys, get tough. Or come on, give it all up for Jesus. Well, I mean, in a certain way, yes, I do say it for that reason. But in another way... I just say it because I think we should be aware of what's going on in the world around us. Not just in our little clubs or our cliques where we hang out or just in our, our congregation. Not just that, but also what's going on in the world around us, you know. Uh, what's going on in our government. What's going on in our state. Uh, and, and also what is going on in our community. Not, like I say, not just our community of Christ here, but our community, Citrus County. And why do we need to be aware of these things? Uh, you know, the scripture tells us, Peter says this. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And when we're aware of things that are, that are going on around us, when we're aware of the situation in our economy, uh, in, our, uh, in our culture, in our nation, uh, we will be ready to make a defense for the hope that we have uh, in Christ Jesus. And so I encourage you with that as well. And that brings us to our text for today, which is Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. So if you're new to the church or new to the Bible, Matthew is in the New Testament. Um, so you can flip there with us if you'd like to, please. And please, if we could stand up and a quick word, Matthew is the first of the four Gospels. The Gospels are the good news. Uh, they tell us the stories of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. And so we're in the first gospel of Matthew and chapter 4, a beautiful account of his life. And you may have it there as well. I have a little heading in my Bible. It says, Jesus begins his ministry. So Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. So we're talking about Jesus here. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Please be seated. So you may have heard this passage or read this passage many times, heard it growing up if you grew up in the church, but I want to look at it carefully today uh, because it's got a very poignant and beautiful message for us. Um, for today, as well as hope for our everlasting future and our everlasting life. So let's make sure, what I want to start with is getting the context correct. And we see here, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, but it's certainly not the first thing that Jesus ever did publicly. Um, the commentaries and the chronological harmonies would show us uh, that this falls right after what we see in the Gospel of John chapter 1 through 4. Uh, and in the Gospel of John, we see, we, I'm going to walk through that real quickly, that first part that gets us right into the context of where we are. Um, chapter 1, verse 19, uh, we see some very powerful things taking place in John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. His ministry is basically in full tilt. And we see John's testimony what he says to the Jews is that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he's pointing to Jesus. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We come forward into chapter 2, and we see the first miracle that Jesus performed in the wedding at Cana. Everyone remember that one? That was a pretty good one. He turned the water into wine at the wedding uh, to save embarrassment for the, for the bridegroom. And it wasn't uh, one glass of water that he turned into wine. The scripture tells us it was probably about 120 gallons. That's a pretty incredible, uh, miraculous thing we see Jesus do there. Um, then we see he goes to Jerusalem for Passover. And John 2.23 tells us, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. When they saw the signs Jesus was doing. So we know Jesus performed more signs in Jerusalem to confirm his identity, uh, his identity as the Lamb of God, the Christ. Continuing forward in chapter 3, again, we're preparing the way for where we arrive to here. Um, chapter 3 of John, we see the very famous story of the night meeting that Jesus had with Nicodemus, um, one of the teachers of Israel, if not the foremost teacher in Israel. Nicodemus came to him by night. And we see the beautiful message, the incredible message that Jesus said that one must be born again. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he testified to Nicodemus about how God showed his great love for the world by the miraculous sacrifice he made. And we can all think about the verse that we probably all know very well is John 3.16. Uh, think about that together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we praise God for that. And we come forward to the end of chapter 3 in John's gospel. And we see Jesus baptizing alongside his disciples. And the scripture actually tells us it was actually his disciples that were baptizing but they were baptizing very near in proximity to where John the Baptist was at that point. And yet again, we see John the Baptist exalt Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Beautiful stuff there. So we've, get, we've gotten our context settled in and the timeline here as we get to Matthew 4. And we're almost ready to look at our verses but we still need our geography. So we've got the context and the timeline, but we need our geography. So we remember this um, at the end of chapter 3 of John. He's down in Jerusalem. He had been in, in the, at the Passover and in Judea with the baptisms. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea in the south of Israel, right? Uh, but we pick up our scripture here and it says he withdrew into Galilee. Galilee is in the north. So... To arrive from the south to the north, he's got to pass through one region. Anyone remember that region that's in the middle there? Somebody does. Samaria. Samaria is right. And who does he meet on that little track that he takes through Samaria? He meets a lady at a certain well in Sychar. Remember that story from John 4? The lady at the well. And amazingly, the scripture tells us this is the first convert to Christianity. The first convert to Christianity is none other than a Samaritan woman. Am I reading that right? You know, and, and this is an amazing thing, and I want to come back to a point that uh, Pastor Brian shared two weeks ago. It's a very important point. You know, if the Bible was just written, you know, to really make Christianity look great, you know, and make Jesus look great. You know, maybe it's some stories, you know, some fables, etc., etc. I can tell you one thing. From that cultural context, the first convert to Christianity would not have been a Samaritan woman. If we understand the context of that, of that culture, women were treated basically as property. Property. That's what the women were. And to make it much worse, this is a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritans were considered the hated half-breeds for the Jews. And why was that? You see, they were 50% Jewish. We're talking generally here, the race. 50% Jewish and 50% Assyrian. Which made them 100% hated by the Jews. Unpure, 100% hated. So why would we have this story here? Was it to make Christianity look great? Well, certainly not in that cultural context. It didn't. We have the story in John 4 
Because it's true. Because the scripture is true. It's God's word and it's true. They don't have to make things up to speak about what Jesus did. So now we're back to our text and we got our geography. And here we see a prophecy being fulfilled as Jesus moves to live in Capernaum by the sea. Uh, the region of Galilee is in the north and it says here the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Naphtali. And Matthew tells us that this geographical location fulfills a prophecy from approximately 700 years earlier from the prophet Isaiah. And Zebulun and Naphtali are two of the tribes of Israel that came into the promised land that God gave to the sons of Jacob. If we remember the promise to Abraham, the promise that carried on to Isaac, to Jacob and his sons came into the promised land. And you probably remember all the allotments as Pastor Brian talked through Joshua uh, last year. You guys probably all remember exactly how those allotments go. But just in case there's anyone who wasn't there for that day of the allotments, um, you'll remember that Zebulun, and you can see that Zebulun and Naphtali were in fact there all the way in the north of the land of Israel, in the land of the promised land. And that's exactly where we find ourselves uh, in the land of Galilee, uh, what was known as Galilee in Jesus' time. So what is this prophecy that we see in this location? Well, we see it in verse 16. Uh, Matthew 4, 16, our passage, it says, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Can you imagine that? That's not the place to be dwelling in darkness, dwelling in the region and shadow of death. And don't we know there are people around us today who are living in darkness? There are people who are living in the shadow of death. And I'm not speaking about only in Colombia, or in the far reaches of the world. We're speaking about people who are apart from Christ, right here around us, right here in our nation. And the beautiful prophecy fulfilled here, the light that we see for those people, the light that shined into our dark hearts when we were apart from Christ, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And what a beautiful thing we see in verse 17. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the NIV actually translated it, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And that implies what my study Bible said here on verse 17. Uh, here in my study Bible it says, uh, when we talk about this piece, it says, the opening word of this first sermon of Jesus Christ sets the tone for Jesus' entire earthly ministry. And what was the opening word? Repent. Repentance was a constant motif in all his public preaching. And in his closing charge to the apostles, he commanded them to preach repentance as well. And they gave us two references that I'm going to read that come from Luke 5. So the first one is Luke 5, 31 and 32, talking about it was a constant motif of what he was preaching. So Luke 5, we're down the road a little bit in his public ministry. It said, Jesus Christ said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And when it talked about the closing charge here in the study Bible that I have, uh, it referenced Luke 24, verses 45 through 47. And we'll remember this comes at the end of the walk of Emmaus. It says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So this is the message that Jesus Christ shared. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We understand the king of heaven himself the king of glory came down and he said, 
My kingdom is at hand. And don't we know that we have now His words? We have the glory of His salvation. The kingdom is at hand for us as well. We have the same word that we can share with people. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's a question, because maybe we, we don't talk about it enough, and, uh, and I, I can speak for myself. I don't speak about it enough. What is repentance exactly, and why is it commanded like this? We're going to look at a couple pieces of Scripture to help us understand it. Isaiah 45, 22. Here's what Isaiah says. Turn to me. This is what God says. Excuse me. Through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. So that's relatively simple from God himself. Turn to me and be saved. The scripture teaches us that repentance is given by God. It's a gift from God. Acts eleven eighteen says, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. God granted repentance. God granted repentance to you and to me. 2 Timothy 2.25, as we talk about this gift of repentance, it's a gift from God. It's given by God. I'm going to read the context here. And the Lord's servants, this was... Uh, instruction from Paul to Timothy and the Lord's servants servant must not be quarrelsome but kind to everyone able to teach patiently enduring evil correcting his opponents with gentleness God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will so again, he said, Paul says, they'll come to their sentence. God may perhaps grant them repentance. Um, the scripture also teaches that repentance is necessary for the pardon of sins. Uh, Acts 2, we're going to read three, three pieces from Acts. Acts 2.38 says, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again in Acts 3.19 Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Continuing in Acts 8.22 Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. So we see it's a gift of God. We see that it's necessary for the forgiveness of sins. And um, we also have an illustration, excuse me, I want to share an illustration that, um, that I learned as a new believer. Um, it was very helpful for me uh, when I was a new follower. And, and it goes a little something like this. Re repentance is like this. You're going down the road, you're going down the interstate, 70 miles an hour, you're cruising in life and you think you got it going on. The problem is you realize you're going the wrong direction. 70 miles an hour, but you're going the wrong direction. Well, what do you need to do? You have to stop. You have to get off the interstate, take the exit ramp, go back the other way, turn around, and go the right way. That's what repentance is. We talk about coming to our senses. We realize we're going the wrong way. So the, the way that it, it, it applies to our spiritual life is this. We're going down the highway of life going the wrong way. Walking in sin. Living in sin. Like Sean talked about, the sins that we know about, that we'll admit, that we stole, that we lied, that we committed adultery or lust in our hearts. We blaspheme the name of God Almighty. We're going down the road and we're cruising and we're committing sin. We're walking in that sin. The scripture says we love our sin. We're pursuing our sin. We realize though at that point when God gives the gift of repentance, we have to stop. We have to stop that lifestyle. We have to get off the road of sin. And we have to turn back and return to God and be saved. And as we do that, the Lord gives us the gift of life, the gift of salvation, the gift of repentance, the gift of sanctification, where we walk in His ways. We learn His ways. We begin to love His ways and love His people. 
and we're traveling the right way by God's grace and His Spirit. And one other thing that, uh, thinking back to when I was a new believer, is our old pastor in Atlanta was Dr. Stanley when we were new believers. And he said it's very important to understand the difference between confession and repentance. And it's kind of easy for me to put it back on the highway idea. You know, confession is like, uh, you just keep cruising. You know, yeah, I, I did steal that, you know. And I'm cruising, baby. That's all right. Like, uh, if we can remember our lives before Christ, which I can very easily, confession is like basically saying, you know, I'm sorry. But at that point, without Christ, it's basically saying, what I, what I was saying is, I'm sorry I got caught. You know, I'm sorry you found out about it. That's really what it was like for me. I'm not sorry that I did it, really. I'm just sorry I got caught doing it. That's what it means before Christ. Repentance is a different thing. Repentance is understanding it's wrong and turning away from it. And um, John MacArthur put it this way when he described biblical repentance. He talked about a total change, a total change in life. It's more than sorrow. It's to change your life, change your purpose, change your opinion, change your direction. It's an inner change of the heart leading to an outer change of life. A radical change in the heart. A radical change in the mind and the will. That's the issue. That's what MacArthur said. So we need to turn to God. And why are we to repent? Well, in the scripture, it's a command. Jesus doesn't say, when it's good for you, repent. Or when you feel like it, or when you reach the end of that job, or this assignment, or this time period, then repent. Now, it's a command. He said, repent, and he tells us why. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what a beautiful thing. And it, and it should be and it can be a normal part of our Christian life. Repentance. Repentance is having ourselves before God and being right before God by His forgiveness. Receiving His forgiveness. It's a normal thing because we belong to the living God. We serve the living God. And we can have that growing relationship daily by His Word, by His Spirit, by confession and repentance through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness we have in Him. The living God tells us we can have these things. Think about this. He tells us to cast our cares upon Him for He cares for us. He says He will not leave us nor forsake us. He says that He is faithful even if we are faithless. And he tells us that we can draw near to his throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. That is why we repent. Because we have a Heavenly Father who loves us. Um, can you hear... Thinking about another idea um, that I was thinking about as I was studying this week, it's a, a bit of a personal example, and um, some of you guys might know this that that I like sports. I'm not sure if I've ever shared that with the with the church, but I, I like sports. Um, and while we lived in Italy, I had an opportunity to work in sports ministry, so that was where we were sharing the gospel uh, through sports and in sports, and um, and I was involved with a with a network that was called the European Christian Sports Union. A uh, really cool thing that I really enjoyed uh, serving there. And through that network I met an American guy back in 2015 in Italy. And he says to me, uh, well, I play football down in Florence. Uh, you know, in other parts of the world, you guys might know this, football is not what we know of football. And I'm thinking to myself, but this guy's from the south of the United States. I said, do you say football? It's not like you said football, man. Football's football, right? And that guy did. He was serving with Athletes in Action, and he was serving with a football team in Florence. We were just about to move into the province of Florence, and lo and behold, just a couple months later, there we were, and uh, and I was serving 
with that team uh, in Florence. It was really, really cool getting a chance to coach there. Um, I served with that team for three seasons. Uh, it's the world famous Guelfi Firenze. I'm sure uh, Francois knows the team, I'm sure, of world fame. Francois is just up the road in, uh, in France. No, but uh, obviously football, our football is not as big in Europe, but man, we sure had a lot of fun. And the deal there was uh, they have a different culture there. Um, and throughout the time there, I actually got to know another coach, another American guy, a Christian guy, Brett. And he came my last year that I was there, and he was the head coach in Florence. And so I was the defensive coordinator with Brett, and, uh, and I was the chaplain as well. And it was a really exciting time, but I had a lot to learn from Brett, um, from the techniques of grading players. He brought a really high level to the team, to the club, making adjustments in the game, before the game, after the game. Uh, it was a really exciting time for me. I was learning a lot. And you see, Brett brought in a whole different level because Brett coached with the Calgary Stampeders when they won the Great Cup in the CFL. Uh, and in case you don't know, the CFL, the Canadian Football League, is the second strongest league in the world behind the NFL. So Brett was at a whole different level than what we were used to over there because we were kind of just having fun. And before Brett got there, you know, we'd kind of coach him up during the, during the week, you know, and slap him on the field and say, go get him, boys. And, uh, and Brett, that didn't work for Brett. Uh, Brett was moving things at a whole different speed. And I really enjoyed it because that's more like what I'm used to, but I had kind of adopted the way that they did it in Italy. Um, but the one lesson that Brett taught me that, that I thought was so cool, that applied to football, of course, but it also, I took it to my life. He said, coaches don't watch the ball. You know, maybe you watch a game, you watch a Gators play or your team, and you watch them, oh, see what happens, there's a pass, you watch them, receive catch it. He said, no, no, coaches watch their players so they can coach their players to be better players. And that took a lot of hard work for me, actually, because up to that point, I'd basically just been watching the ball, kind of watching what was going on, cheering the guys on and whatnot. That was the way it was in the club up until then. But he said, no, that's not gonna work, man. And so it took a lot of discipline to say, I've got to look at the defensive backs. That was the team, that was the group that I was coaching at that point. And I've got to watch their form. I've got to watch their technique. And I've got to coach them in the game as well, right? To what's going on in the game. How can we make adjustments? And, um, and you know, Brent is a guy who's worked with uh, several different ministries, uh, mission agencies, particularly uh, through sports, and very intense guy. Um, you get him on the football field, man, and, and it's just an intensity, a level that, and I, I, like, I like intense people, I like, uh, I like getting pumped up. But this guy, man, you put him on the football field, it's hard to find someone that intense. So um, we had a great time, and his hard work, um, his dedication he showed to the team, it really gave us an opportunity also to share the gospel with the players, because the players knew he cared about them. He coached them in a way that they knew he cared about what was going on. And by the hard work uh, that we got to put in on the field also gave us a chance, like I said, as a chaplain and, and even on the field to share the gospel with those guys. And it was really a cool thing. And here's the deal. Um, you know, here at Christ Community, we don't want anyone to feel like they're spectators. You know, or feel like they can just, all they can do is sit out in the stands and watch the ball. You know, we want everyone to be plugged in because there's so much more to be had for the Christian walk. Um, we want to see every single member growing individually in Christ, growing within their family, and growing as a part of the body of Christ here at Christ Community. For the glory of Jesus Christ, the Savior, and for the good of this congregation. Uh, the scripture tells us that if we're in Christ, we should walk as Christ did. 1 John 2.6 says it this way. Whoever says he abides in him, whoever says he abides in Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We have to walk in the same way that Jesus Christ walked. And that's a beautiful encouragement for us. Um, and the question you may say is, well, how can, how can I be plugged in? How can I grow like that and, and get in the game? Well, it's, there's a few simple ways. And by the scripture, back, back in the very beginning, God's word, by prayer, by repentance and turning to God, turning away from sin and turning to God. By meditating on God's word as we read it, studying it. By discipleship, which is being discipled and making disciples. And by having fellowship here with the believers. So it starts individually in the presence of God Almighty. 
But it doesn't finish there. It just grows from there. And everyone has a role in the body of Christ. Everyone can have a role here in the church. Because we know that every person has different treasures and talents in their lives. And the beautiful thing, the scripture says that we receive spiritual gifts upon salvation. So each and every one of us, if we're walking with Christ through salvation, we have treasures, talents, and gifts that God's bestowed upon us. And all of those are to be used for the edification of the body. So if you find yourself today here and you're thinking, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about how to use my gifts. Um, I really don't know about any of the stuff you're talking about. And there might even be someone here who says, well, you know, the football stuff I can understand. But I don't understand this Bible stuff. Um, I don't know about the, the repentance thing you're talking about or the church stuff. I don't know all this stuff. And that's okay because you're in the right place today. You're in a place with people who love you. There are people here today who can walk you through what it means to be a Christian, who can walk you through repentance to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We're here because we love one another. We're here because the scripture says we're to love our neighbors. And just to make one thing clear, the, the scripture also teaches that we were created to have a relationship with God. The scripture says that we were created in God's image. That's an incredible truth to think about. But the scripture tells us some bad news from that point. And as I said, we care for you and we share the whole truth here. The bad news is that sin has broken our relationship with God Almighty. It started back in the garden. Adam and Eve, their sin destroyed their relationship with God. And the same is true for you and I. Today, our sin destroys our relationship with Christ. Um, if anyone is honest with themselves, you need to only look at the Ten Commandments to see uh, that we have sinned. And Paul said it this way, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we should understand that that sin separates us from a holy God. From there, the news only gets worse. That we're not able to cancel our own sin or erase our own sin. Or think to yourself, well, I did do that one thing, but you know, I also did five things that were good. It's not a weighted scale before God Almighty. There's no vote, you know, two thumbs up and one thumb down and you get in. It's not like that. James 2 says, whoever keeps the whole law, the whole law, and stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. And you may be thinking, well, that's not fair. That's not cool. Well, we're talking about God Almighty. God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the maker of all things seen and unseen, and his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That's where we stand before Christ in judgment. That's where I was, far from God, by my own sinful decisions. And yet we have this beautiful good news as we read the Gospels, that Jesus Christ made a way when there was no way by ourselves. The scripture tells us he suffered, died, and rose on the third day. We couldn't make our own way, but God. God made a way for you, for me, for anyone who turns to Christ for forgiveness and repentance. And that is the grace of God. The scripture says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. And today the scripture says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul told us, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And you might be thinking, well, saved from what? Saved from God's wrath. Saved from eternal separation and punishment of God. Today you can put your faith in Jesus Christ alone and you can know that you would have everlasting life. 1 John 5.13 says, 
I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And you can experience God's beautiful deliverance this very day from eternal separation and death to eternal life in Christ. And we come back to the command that Mark gave us, just what we were speaking about today. In Mark 1, 15, Jesus said, Repent and believe in the gospel. We do this simply by faith in our hearts, confession from our lips, and the subsequent actions of repentance that demonstrate that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day together. Would you help us to walk in newness of life through repentance and faith? Remember the gift that you've given us in the forgiveness of our sins and new life in Christ. Would you please keep us, Lord, as the apple of your eye? Would you hide us in the shadow of your wings? And would you help us to glorify you greatly within our homes, with our families, in our community, and in our nation? Lord, we ask these things in your mighty and powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is uh, going to be a wonderful opportunity to give us a visible expression of repentance. We're asking the Lord uh, to grant us repentance as we uh, see Him in the visible uh, expression of the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper through uh, the cup and also the bread. The night that Jesus was betrayed, He said, This is my body given for you, broken. Do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup and he said, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. We invite everyone that's a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we ask that you uh, refrain from the table. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we ask that you can come and uh, participate. They're gonna, we're going to sing a song as soon as we begin the song. We ask that one representative from uh, your family go and get the, the cup. And the bread, they're uh, together in the little cups. Uh, the bread's on top and the juice is on the bottom. We'll take the bread first and then we'll take the cup uh, next. Uh, we'll do that together. Um, if you're gluten-free, on the left side is uh, gluten-free. We have juice uh, only and then the gluten-free uh, crackers uh, that we invite you to t participate in uh, through that. So um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says... To the Corinthians remind them that we don't take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We need to ask the Lord to examine our hearts and to reveal to us those sins as we already said today that we have committed knowingly, those things we have committed unknowingly, those things we have not done we should have done, those things we did that we should have done. And ask the Lord to grant us as Brother Robert uh, read and preached from the Scripture of Matthew 417, that God would grant us repentance. That God grant us a turning away from those things and a complete trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray. As soon as I finish praying, we're going to uh, begin to sing. And then uh, you guys can uh, go ahead and uh, grab uh, the necessary elements. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that you don't leave us traveling on the highway going in the wrong direction. But Jesus, you came and got us. You turned us around. And you headed us toward you. We praise you for that. We know that doesn't come by our own willpower or our own insight, but it comes through your sovereign grace. And we praise you. Father, we ask that as we participate in this supper, reminded of your body broken for us, your, your blood poured out for us, Lord, we thank you that, Jesus, you actually did pay it all. That there's absolutely nothing we can do to merit salvation, but, Jesus, you accomplished it thoroughly and fully when you gave your life once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that you might bring us to God. 
Father, we ask that you would help us to examine our hearts, grant us repentance, grant us forgiveness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. of your son Jesus that you bore the wrath we deserve and your body was broken in our place. Thank you. On that same night as he took the cup he blessed it and both elements he said do this in remembrance of me. Lord we thank you for your blood that was shed in our place and covers us from all our sins. Past present, and future. Lord, we ask that you would be blessed and honored, and Lord, that you would renew us. We thank you as we confess our sins. You're faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As surely as his blood was shed for us, we had the confidence that there was not one wasted drop that in John Chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus says, it is finished. Amen. So we have the glorious promise. As we drink this cup and eat this bread, there's nothing magical about it, but it reminds us of the surety and the certainty that we have eternal life in Jesus Christ because of what He has accomplished through His Son. Jesus has accomplished for us on our behalf in the cross. And it's stamped and it's approved the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
And he says in 1 Corinthians 11 that as surely as we eat this bread and as we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That he's coming back again. That it's not just Christmas that we celebrate, but it's the new heavens and the new earth that we anticipate. That Jesus will come, bring us to himself, and until that day, we're going to end with this song. Until that day, we're going to proclaim his gospel. We're going to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the kingdom is here. The king has come. And Jesus is demanding everyone everywhere to repent and turn unto him. So let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord as we close. And just a reminder, we do have a member meeting uh, right after this. It's going to be short and sweet. And it's going to be uh, a time for us to, that we can cast our votes and uh, move on uh, with the budget and several things uh, that are going on this next year. So um, praise the Lord. Let's uh, worship the Lord together. And for uh, our uh, elders or deacons, one of them will be at the, the back of the service to collect a benevolence offering uh, as the Lord leads uh, for you to drop in some uh, money for the benevolence needs. That would be great. All right, let's worship together.